Welcome, folks. Uh, Jeff Jensen, Program Manager, Field Coordinator with Trees Forever. Uh, that's 12 noon. The little chime on my uh, computer let me know that it's 12 noon and we're in store for a webinar today. So welcome, everyone. I um, want to thank you for joining us over the noon hour here. We have a great presentation and webinar uh, lined up. Uh, with that, um, I want to welcome Tivone Feely. And so um, he is with the Iowa DNR, and he is their Forest Health Program Leader. And with that, T-Bone, take it away. Thank you, Jeff. Well, first, I want to welcome everybody, and thank you for joining the webinar. As uh, Jeff was saying, we'd like to keep this as interactive as you can, which is very difficult to do in a webinar. So when you do have questions, please put them in the chat box. Uh, Jeff's going to keep track of them. If we run out of time, we can't get them answered, I will get back to you. Um, we'll get all the answers out there. So I'm on camera now. I'm going to shut that off here momentarily um, so we can keep our streaming speeds. All right. So today we're going to talk a little bit about some of our forest health issues that we have with these non-native invasive species. Oh, oh get it going. Um, so we got to define what those are, and that can be a little bit confusing depending on your background. So let's go through the terminology real quick, and then I've got a lot of colorful slides that will make this a little bit more palatable to look at. But a non-native means that it's foreign to our landscape that we're in here. It came from somewhere else. And an invasive plant or insect or disease or pathogen is no longer desirable. It's moved off site, and it's started invading into the native ecosystem. And the word invasive gets really confusing, especially if you are ever in western Iowa. And if you manage prairies, they look at eastern red cedar as an invasive species. In the forest health world, that's not how we look at it. We look at that as a pioneering species, a species that comes in early on to reclaim the land, to reforest it in the absence of fire and other prairie management tools. So there is a difference between invasive and pioneering in our in our in our world right now. So um, not a native invasive species impact all kinds of things. Right now, the local regeneration that we see of the flora and fauna, fauna and wildlife that depends on the native trees. And I'll show you a few examples of that one that might be kind of surprising to people in this group. And one of them that we talk about a lot is water quality. You might get an uh, invasive plant that makes a blanket in the woodland area and a park area, and the, the soil erodes underneath that. So and they get out of control because they're not native here. And so they don't have the natural predators, the insects, the diseases, and even the wildlife that helps keep them in check. And so their populations grow pretty quickly. All right. So I want to go through different types. We're going to look at diseases, we're going to look at insects, and then we're going to look at invasive plants. And I picked some that are pretty paramount overall. So the first one we're looking at Will be it's called chestnut blight and it was identified in new york in 1905 it has killed 99 percent of all the chestnut trees are completely gone from the landscape this is kind of important to think about you know we had a disease a fungal disease that came in killed 99 percent of all of those trees um, and it's carried if you look at it it's carried by insects birds other wildlife and wind and rain so this is a fungus that moved very rapidly and we use this as the gold standard in the plant pathology world for tree disease because there isn't anything that was quite like that in history where it came in so quickly killed so high of a percentage and um, we still don't have those trees back fully and we probably won't so it came in early 1905 and wiped them out and i'll show you some pictures of that the other one that we're probably more familiar because we do have elm here is dutch elm disease um, first recorded in Iowa, in Lee and Scott County, so in eastern Iowa in 1956, and approximately 95% of the urban elm trees are still out there. There's a lot of difference between Dutch elm disease um, and emerald ash borer, let's say, because we hear that comparison a lot. So Dutch elm disease, what happens there, is the fungus that causes the beetles that carry the fungus don't invade or attack that tree until they're about 14, 15 inches in diameter or greater, which allows that tree to produce seed. And that's why you can go out in your woodlands and you'll see elms re-sprouting everywhere. If you look at chestnut blight, it'll kill them at a very young age. 
um, Emerald Ash Borer we mentioned moments ago, it'll also kill them as little as an inch in diameter. So that's a big difference. So Dutch Elm disease was devastating as well, but let's take a look at this. You should be seeing a bunch of great big large diameter trees out there and a couple guys standing. This is the American chestnuts out east. This is from the uh, Chestnut Foundation. They sent me a couple photos to put in here. Not the best quality, a little grainy, but they're old photos and you can get an idea. You know, there's some literature that talk about these as being the sequoias of the east and you can see why. These are giant trees. These are really old growth chestnuts and we lost them all from the disease. There's some management issues as well, but primarily the disease. And you can see the cross section of one of the trees to the left and then the right, the logging industry. And a lot of this is post blight coming in. So a lot of interesting photos, but we lost this significant tree. Like I said, it's mainly in the east. And so the light green color you see in the left-hand side of the screen, that's the native chestnut range or where it was at. And there are very little in terms of chestnut trees still here. Um, as you can see, Iowa is not in that range, so it didn't impact our state directly. Um, to the right, you can see the fungal canker that forms when the disease gets in there. And that fungus just makes that ring that grows consecutively out and eventually strangles the tree until it can't get water and nutrients to move up and it wilts out. So that's chestnut blight. Here are the elms, pre-Dutch elm disease. And this was a learning opportunity for us all. As beautiful as this street looks with all of these elms and their curved architecture closing in the canopy, it was a mistake. Um, we have no diversity here. And when elm, Dutch elm disease came in, all these elms died almost uniformly and became a huge burden on the communities that had to take them down. And Dutch elm disease can spread above ground, but also these trees are likely root grafted below ground and the disease, disease can sp spread that way as well. So what we used to have, and then here's a elm line street as they topped them and starting to take them down. And we still see trees wilting today. There's a picture one to the right from the ISU plant disease clinic. But so this would be our other one. We have management tools for Dutch elm disease. You can get uh, disease resistant elms now on the market, true American elms. And occasionally we'll find a few landowners that want to take the time to inject their tree with the fungicide uh, like Arbor Tech S and a few others to keep that original American elm alive and healthy. And so we have a few on universities, both on the campus of Iowa State University in Ames and University of Iowa that are injected. So, so insect examples, I think we all know the first one I'm gonna bring up, I mentioned it, that's emerald ash borer. And I don't know that we have a higher pest occurrence of anything else in the state besides emerald ash borer at the moment. Emerald ash borer this year is at its highest numbers that I've seen in a while. And it attacks all Fraxinus, so the true ash, which are white, black, and green. It's a primary killer. The trees don't have to be dying to die out, uh, so they don't mind attacking healthy trees, which we're seeing. And it was first seen in the summer of 2002. The most famous picture, oh, let me back that up a second, if I can. The most famous picture is that picture of the emerald ash borer on the penny, because it shows you the size compared to Abraham Lincoln's head on that penny and the year 2002 that it was found. So it became a very famous picture. Once again, the light green is the native range for all of the Fraxinus species. And then that red dot was where it was first found up in Michigan and how it spread from there. And what I'd like to do is kind of look at a, almost like a, a, it's a spread rate map. So you can see how quickly this particular insect moved out from what was first identified to the rest of the country. So we'll go through those real quick in a moment. So emerald ash borer, again, brilliant green underneath and with its top of the wings, can get a purplish color if you lift those up. Um, the larva, they're a flat-headed borer, but they're kind of unique. They have the nice bell-shaped curves at the end of the body. You can see them there. This is the stage that kills the tree. It eats underneath the bark and kills that phloem and cambium layer. And when they do that, they tend to make this S shape or serpentine type gallery. And you can see the larva to the right there as it's snaked back and forth. Um, how did emerald ash borer spread? Well, the first one is natural spread. It can just fly from one tree to the next. As we know, it likes to find 
healthy trees and infect them as well. Artificial spread, it moved very quickly, partly because of firewood. And we've had a relook at how firewood moves around in the country and within the state and things that we can do to encourage people to buy wood local. You can get it in infested logs. So the sawmill industry might get an ash log that has it. And there was a lot of quarantines originally that prevented them from going from one state to the other, but most of those have been lifted anymore because emerald ash borer has moved throughout our state and many others. Uh, the movement of infested nursery stock was the next one, but I don't think you're gonna see any of the frax nest species being sold in the nursery today. So we're going back to December 31st, 2002, and you can see the Michigan area. And at that time, all the red areas were what we knew to be the area for emerald ash borer infestations. So we're gonna go through these and you'll get to see it spread. So here's 2002, going to 2000, 2003, and you can see Michigan's getting hit pretty hard. And now we showed up in Ohio and it just keeps spreading. It's 2005 and six, 2007, eight, you know, it's right next to Iowa and Illinois, 2009, 2010 is our first find. If you look at Northeast Iowa, it was on an island in the Mississippi uh, up in Alamakee County, and that was our first find. So 2010, you can watch it from 2011, all the way in Kansas City, Missouri area in 12, 13. And now if you look at 2013, you can see Southern Iowa start to fall along Highway 34. The map today is just like this, everything in green, has emerald ash borer. We found it during 2010 to 2018. That kind of bluish green is 2019. That lime green is 2020 and the red is this year. So very few counties that do not have emerald ash borer right now. So a very challenging pest. I would say the number one phone call I get there are from communities asking, is there any assistance to remove trees? And sadly there is not at this time. So another pest that we monitor for through our community inventories is called Asian longhorn beetle. And this is a beautiful insect, I'll show you this, but it is a aggressive killer, especially of the acer or the maples. So it's gonna go after the maples and a few other species, but it is a big insect, probably about as big as your thumb if you were to hold it out, but it's got those long antennae that are longer than its body. And if you look at its legs, they have those bright blue stripes on it. So this, those characteristics will help you separate it from some of our natives. There is a beetle called pine sawyer beetle that we see often in the state that has a black body and white spots, but it doesn't have the blue stripes on its leg and it's not quite as big. So when these get in the tree, they leave an exit hole that's quite large, about the size of a dime and very deep into the tree. Um, it's about three eighths inch round exit hole. Like I said, you're gonna see this most likely on maples are gonna sprout and die, but we've got a pretty hefty survey on this pest because it was as close to Iowa as Chicago in 1998. The good news is because of the size of this beetle, it makes it a little bit easier to detect. Emerald ash borer is much smaller, moved multiple ways. This one, you can see that exit wound on the tree. So you know that it was there and you can trap them and they tend to stay on the same tree for a while. So in Chicago, it was found in 1998, but it was eradicated in 2008. You can see that New York is still active. They're still working on it in Long Island. And then there is two other places in New Jersey that have since now been cleaned up. Um, Massachusetts is closed. I'd be surprised if they don't have that one closed by the end of this year. The one that is still active and we watch this is that Bethel, Ohio being the closest one to us now. So it's been active since 2011, and there were 13,719 trees that have been part of this quarantine method. So it just shows the, the, the need to keep things at home if you can and not move wood products around. This one I'm gonna talk about briefly. It's kind of interesting what's going on in this world. I've got it listed as disbar moth, it's Latin name, because it's going through a renaming process. Um, it was formerly known as gypsy moth, but the name is definitely culturally insensitive, um, especially to people from Romania and that part of the world. And so there was um, a request to the Entomological Society of America to rename the species, and that's going on now. But this caterpillar has those blue dots you see at the top, 
You'll see six sets of those, and then you have the bread following it down the tail. It loves to eat just about any tree species, but primarily you see it on the oaks first. And the quarantine map is everything in red and those various colors there. So if you look at Wisconsin in the southwest part, you can see that it's only two counties away from Alabakee County. And we are a part of a, a trapping program to monitor for this pest called Slow the Spread. It's one of those great pests that we can we can trick in the air, and I'll show you some of those in a picture here. But here they are feeding, and they'll completely chew out the tissue of the leaf down to the veins and make the tree look very bare. So to the left, we have the caterpillars going up and down, feeding on this tree. This is a red oak. And then to the right, you can see the um, female moths. And underneath them, you can see kind of a, a fuzzy cardboard colored material. Well, that's their egg masses. And the reason this pest moves very slowly is because the females don't fly, only the males do. And so they're stuck to that tree. They can get some movement with wind and a few other factors, human movement's the biggest one, but um, they'll stay on that tree, lay their eggs. But each one of those egg masses can have a few hundred moths in it, up to 300 easily. And so it's really important that if you go into that quarantined area, that you do inspections. And when they talk about gypsy moth inspections, they want you to look underneath your tires in that wheel well, that hub area. Um, if you have a boat to ch check your trailer and everything for these light tan egg masses and peel them off if you see them so you don't bring them into an area where we don't have it. So there's an, a, an immense checklist, especially if you're moving homes from a quarantine area out that the USDA asks you to go through. To the left, those are our delta traps. You've probably seen those around the state. We place oh, about 10,000 statewide of these traps, which is a pretty intensive monitoring program. To the right, you can see the male moth, large antennae, very big, very unique. And it's got this kind of chevron pattern on the back. And if you were to get a hand lens and look at the face of it from the front, they really look like a bat. So there are some common names that what, that are proposed. One of them is a bat-faced moth and now and a chevron moth. So soon we'll have a name by the end of the year, but um, for now we'll call it dispar moth. When the dispar moth is high enough, we use air tractors like you see here. And underneath that wing, you can see a, a hopper where we put in little pieces of pheromone, which is the scent of the female. And we spray it all over that forest. And it doesn't kill anything, but what it does is the entire forest smells like a female. So the males can't find them to mate and the populations go down, they crash. And this is one of the fastest and easiest ways to control gypsy moth. When the numbers get high enough, we have to use another chemical called BTK. Uh, BT is probably something you're familiar with if you garden a lot. It is a bacteria. Uh, BTK is very specific to just caterpillars. So when you spray that over the forest, if you have an outbreak of gypsy moth, you can kill them. We did have one spot where we had gypsy, gypsy moth near Bellevue in Jackson County and the egg masses were there and it was established and we did treat that with BTK a few years ago and those populations are gone. Right now we're picking up those traps that we just talked about there to the left. We are sorting them now and we're trying to figure out the numbers. So I would expect that within the next five to 10 years, at least one county in Wisconsin will go into the quarantine area and it will just inch closer and closer to Iowa. Um, it, it could be, you know, 10 years or more before we see quarantines into our state or the moth in breeding populations on its own here where we can't control it with mating disruption. So we're getting closer. It's something that we have to monitor all the time. But once again, you're gonna hear me say that human movement. You know, we had that with emerald ash borer. We have that with, with this moth, this far moth, formerly known as gypsy moth, and just about every pest that we talk about, the Asian long -arm beetle as well. So just some awareness. One that's been making the press lately is this beautiful insect. And I've always kind of wondered how it came up with this name. It's called spotted lanternfly. And it's from China and it was introduced into the United States being studied. There's a lot about the species we don't fully understand, but it's not, not a fly. <laughs> so 
I'm not sure why we call it a lantern fly. It's a true bug. Um, it's got a host range that's a little different. There was a little bit of excitement in the forest health world when it was found because it was originally killing a tree of heaven, which is an invasive plant. So we thought, well, this may not be so bad. But then we found that that's one of its hosts. It likes to go to all the fruit trees and the grapes. Those are going to be its primary things. From there, it'll hit just about every species of deciduous tree. You can find the egg masses on, not necessarily killing them, but causing some damage. So the adults in the upper left, it's got the wings closed there, so you don't see the bright red. If you look at the adult in bottom left, you can see that bright red. This caused a few reports to come into the Department of Agriculture and DNR this year from the Iowa City area and Cedar Rapids area, where somebody found, it. in this case, it was a moth that had a almost red color like that, which you see in the bottom left, but it turned out to be uh, underwing moth, a pink underwing moth. So it was a pink color underneath, but we really do appreciate people calling in and say, hey, I caught something that might be spotted lanternfly. Nine times out of 10, we can rule it out you know, with just a photo. If it's something you want to email or text, we can take a look and see. If you look at the nymphs, the early stages are that dark black with white spots, it's that late stage it can be confusing. So we do get some reports in the springtime because it looks very much like box elder nymphs. And so sorting those out could be difficult. A lot of it will be based on the hosts where they're around. Box elder bugs are going to be on your acer, your maple species more often. And this should be mainly in the tree of heaven species right now overwintering. The egg masses are to the right. Very difficult to see, but in the bottom right, it's a close up. You can see them kind of lined up. So the egg masses right now, or there should be egg masses pretty much right now if they were here. Once again, this pest has not been found in Iowa, but it was brought up nationally, um, if you follow the news, from a 4-H kid in uh, Kansas, I think where he was at, that somehow got one for his insect collection and took it to um, a state fair and entered it. He did get a blue ribbon in the end, but he had a quarantine pest and it just set off everybody's alarms. Like, did he find it locally? Did he bring it in from somewhere else? How did he get it? And all of these other things. So there's a lot in the movement of these pests that we're gonna be learning on for years. Um, I didn't mention it with Emerald Ash Borer, but if I were to ask people, well, what's the fastest way it moved in the state of Iowa? I think they'd be shocked to know that by the rail road is probably the fastest way. We've got a few publications out now on it. And they weren't writing in wood material. Um, when Emerald Ashmore was at high populations in the yards where the trains would stop, they would just fly into the cars. And now that we look at spotted lanternfly, we'll ask that same question is, are they laying their eggs on anything that could be moving? Could they possibly be jumping on these cars? Where else can we start looking? So. This is the potential uh, distribution map where it could go. There's enough different species and host for spotted lantern fly to be viable in these states. And you can see Iowa is in there, Southeast Iowa, especially up to almost Davenport. And uh, so we know that we, we could get it. And to be honest, the battles with insects tend to be a losing battle. Asian longhorn beetle, is one of those rarities where you can get rid of it. This one I think is gonna be here to stay. I don't know that we're gonna be able to eradicate it ever. So the research is going on in the states where it's found at, and if you look closely to the left, you can see that it is in Southeast Indiana. So there are spots where it's showing up. I mentioned we've got a lot to learn at this uh, with this pest. If you look into New York, if you see um, the red dot, it means an isolated or purplish dot an isolated event where we found one insect, but we can't find an infestation. And we don't know how that's happening. We don't know how it's moving, how it got there. How come there was just one or two insects and no breeding population? But Pennsylvania was the first place it was found and it's just spread out from there. Everything in red is a quarantine area, okay? Right now they're internal state quarantines and the feds are still helping with this because it is an exotic species native to China. Plant examples, these can be a little bit more interesting. So if you have some plants you wanna know about, please put them in chat. I think I'm running a little ahead of time here, but one of them I wanted to pick on a little bit is one that we don't think about, and it's commonly planted in the urban world, and that's oriental pear. 
the best examples would be like Calorie and Bradford. Um, they'd like to invade the forest edges, the fence rows, long roads. Um, they can shade out the native plants to prevent regeneration. And in some of our state parks and our state forests, we've had to control them. We use a basal bark spray, which is where you go out with this chemical trifle clear and a little bit of diesel full mixed together is the oil that will absorb it through the bark. And you spray down about five to six inches around the trunk of the tree to kill it in late fall. So October, November is kind of the ideal time. You can kill them year round, but the chemical goes in, absorbs into those tree, and it's called a basal bark spray when you do it that way. But this picture is from Ohio and the roadside and all of that white, all the flowers you see, or the Asian pears, and they've invaded into this space. So anywhere there's disturbances, stuff like that, they tend to move into there. And we're seeing more and more down in south central Iowa. This is becoming a extreme pest. There's a genetic study trying to figure out, are they hybridizing with anything native? Where else are they moving to? So there's quite a bit there. Another one I wanted to pick on a little bit is Norway maple. This is a bigger problem out east, but we are seeing some of this in Iowa where our Norway maple, common cultivars that I've listed here, Olmsted, Royal Red, Schwedler, Crimson King, there's many more. Norway maples are so many cultivars, so many desirable urban species, but unfortunately the plant can get out. And when it invades in the forest, it'll grow in the forest itself, the fence rows and along the roadsides. But it can potentially shade out the trees, we're seeing some of that. Um, that could grow underneath in the forest flow. But the biggest biggest problem that we have is they don't have the same sugar content for our wildlife. So prior to the Americas being discovered, we didn't have maple syrup. You can't tap a maple tree in Europe and make maple syrup from it. It doesn't have the sugar content. It won't taste good. So this is a North American phenomenon. Those wildlife that feed on maple seeds need that higher sugar content and they need the seeds to be on the tree and actively ready to be eaten, you know, during the right time of the year. And we don't have that with the Norway maple. And we're using that same basal bark spray with the same chemical and diesel fuel to, to control these as they show up in, in the forest. So it's, it's causing us to rethink a little bit about what we're planting in urban areas and how, and that can be a challenge, and I'll address that here in just a little bit. But here's a Schwedler maple, that brilliant purplish red color. Um, you can see why it's beloved in the landscape. They are tough trees, pretty hardy trees, you know, especially as we're looking at drier climates right now. Um, this tree can handle it, and the thick leaf can handle the wind and tattering that you might see. But unfortunately, everything you see in the understory of this forest that's green is pretty much a nori maple. And as they own this site, and they're pretty shade and tolerant, they are going to block out anything from growing underneath. And that's where we get a lot of erosion. There's no other native plants. Sorry, I had to take a drink there. No other native plants. Um, so. This is where we have to challenge ourselves and look at creative ways to control this plant. It's not easy to go out there and pick one bigger tree and spray it with that basal bark method. Here you might have to do some overspraying, and I don't like doing that unless there's no other option because you're going to kill whatever native forbs that are there. But in this option, in this case, you don't have a lot of options, so you'd still do it late in the fall. If you notice in your yard, um, I'll pick on silver maple and even. The sugar maple, the leaves will be off that just a little bit sooner than Norway maple. Not a lot, but a little bit. And that gives us a little window to go out and spray these. Garlic mustard is a forest plant, and I put it in here. I kind of debated about sharing it because I didn't know if our group was going to be largely urban, if they're going to be wood, wood owners. But the city of Ames called, and they were concerned about this in their parks this year. So it's another na um, plant native to Asia. Parts of Europe as well. It was introduced in 1868 to the United States, mainly for food. It became a food thing. You can still buy it in restaurants out east. But some people have used it for medicines. There's no natural predators. There is a weevil that we're looking at as a biocontrol. Um, there's a process that's a little difficult, but basically it's got to go through all of these different agencies that all agree and concur that if we introduce this weevil, because it's not native, 
to control another non-native like garlic mustard, that it's only gonna kill garlic mustard. There isn't another plant that it could remove from our ecosystem, or if it does, it's it's worth the risk. Um, so that, that weevil is still being reviewed by National Fish and Wildlife. It's passed through the other groups right now. But I don't know that we're gonna see that release, to be honest, we'll, we'll wait and see. The garlic mustard creates a dense mat of growth underneath, and it prevents anything from germin germinating underneath. So here's some pictures of it. It's a biennial herb. Uh, this is the rosette stage. We have had the most success controlling this plant with prescribed fires. A spring burn. So right after your first thaw, if you have a nice fuel load in the forest, it works. So the question I get is, what do we do in urban areas? So this set off a research for us um, where you may not be able to burn in certain areas. Here is a heavy infestation. This is up in Backbone State Park. This is where we took over a site and we set up some study plots to see what we could do. How can we get rid of this garlic mustard? Here it is growing up in the adult stage. You can see the flowers. The seeds attach onto just about anything. It could be underneath the soles of your shoes, along the side of your pants, the fur on a deer running through, and it spreads pretty quickly. So when you get into the literature, it talks about hand pulling the plants before seed production. And when I first started years ago and we decided to set up a plot at Backbone, I got a, a bunch of volunteers to go out and hand pull and I was up there with them. And it is some of the hardest work you can get. Nobody wants to be out there in the middle of summer pulling garlic mustard, but it is an option if you have a small amount in a small area. Um, you have to do the hand pulling, we found out for at least five years, or you're never gonna deplete that seed source. They're just gonna grow back. And the plants also have to be bagged and they have to have a very thick plastic bag to make sure that they don't get through it and spread again, and they have to get them off site. We did some glyphosate, commonly known as Roundup, sprays in April and May before the native plants were out, and it worked, and it worked well, but it's a little bit pricey. But, um, and you can also do it in the fall, but really it was the, the prescribed fires, the burning that controlled them the best. So when we got into the, the fires, we found out the spring, Burns were the most affordable and had the most impact. Um, glyphosate was next and hand pulling. But we also looked at one called corn gluten mill, often used in urban yards to control broadleaf pest. And we found little to no impact in garlic mustard. Um, garlic mustard in those areas that were treated with corn gluten mill is still there and thriving. So, but if you're ever up in Backbone State Park, there are signs that will lead you to where this study plot is. and the park ranger up there would love to show you it all. The next one, and I think out of everything we're talking about, or at least invasive plants, this is the most concerning to Iowa. This is in Iowa and is causing quite a bit of damage. And this is oriental bittersweet, um, also sometimes called Asiatic bittersweet. It's native to Japan, China, Korea. Once again, since it's a non-native invasive, we don't have any of the native insects or pathogens that keep this plant in check. It's easily spread by wildlife. Um, they like the fruits of it. It was used in the ornamental world to make wreaths and everything else that you can think of because it's got more berries, more fruit than our American bittersweet. Um, I'll show you pictures so you can compare and contrast both of them. But it's commonly referred to as a kudzu of the north because it is a very aggressive vine and likes to shade out the trees. So if you've been in the south and you've seen kudzu, you'll have an idea what that analogy means. So here is oriental bittersweet. And it's got that yellowish red fruit there. Um, the fruit, this is the big thing that you'll see this time of year, you'll find multiple fruits and flowers in the spring um, at, and these stems, and they go all the way up and down this stem. The leaves tend to be more round, okay, than our native bittersweet. Um, and this will be everywhere. You don't see our native bittersweet spreading. So here's American bittersweet, and you can see the leaves are more oblong shaped, if you will. That orangish red fruit, not so much of the yellow and not as many fruits. You see one or two fruits at the end of a, a twig. So far less fruits, you're not gonna see these vines invading. This is just 
everywhere. It's not just a woodland problem. This is an urban problem. Uh, once you see this, you won't forget it, and you'll you'll know. Some things that we learned early on in the game is do not use prescribed fire. Do not burn this plant. It has a very aggressive root system, and that root system is widespread, and it will sprout and re-sprout and sprout. So if you burn it and you damage the plant, you'll have even more young plants to control. Hand pulling, to me, does not work. It does not get those deep root systems, and they are going to sprout and be back soon. Um, torching individual plants works early on, but I don't know of a great method that we're going to keep this out. Because um, when you try the basal bark spray that we talked about, once again, it's that trifle kill with diesel fuel, and you spray those big vines, that's great. But if you're the only landowner controlling the bittersweet and nobody around you is doing it, it's going to reinvade. So this is a costly battle. So up in Backbone, this well, two years ago now, when we had our last basal bark treatment, it was $350 per acre to have it done. So these are pictures of that area. The one to the left, you can see the young vines just starting to reach up into the trees and grow on them. To the right, you can see a much older mature vine. I think this one is close to 12 or 15 years old. We got some that are close to 30 years old up there. They crawl up that tree, they shade out the tree until there's no sunlight for it and the tree dies and they own that site. And if you look at the bottom left, you can see a lot of the yellow leaves in there that, that are going dormant, all oriental bittersweet. And this one here, all oriental bittersweet. And so unfortunately, the chemicals are the way to go when you have a carpet like this, using glyphosate, um, something out there is the way to go to get rid of it, being cognizant of the waterways that could get the, the runoff in it. So. I don't have a great management plan for this one. We have tried and we have tried. There's a 55 acre test block at Backbone as well. And um, we just can't keep the plant from reinvading. So this is something that's gonna take a, a change of how we manage our landscapes and everybody's gonna have to be on board. And the problem with this, you know, when you talk about Asian longhorn beetle, you know, we're talking about maples and we talk about amber lash borer, we're talking about ash. This plant doesn't care. It's going to vine up whatever can grow on, shade it out, kill it, and own this site. And you can lose acres. So this is a root system here after the, the fire. And you can see all the root sprouts that happen. Just aggressive as can be. So definitely don't burn it if you can help it. Here are a couple of plants that are laying out on a deck. And you can see how long. Oh, that should happen there. You can see how long the root system is. This is Tom Brown to the left. He's a, a contractor, Brown's Forestry. This is him spraying and backbone for those vines. You can see how large they are, and he's out there. So three years of doing this, you know, at $350 an acre and 55 acres, and it really did not have much impact. The picture to the left is the first year. The right is the third year. So a little reduction in the understory, but not much. You still have some big vines that made it. We're out there cleaning those up and some underneath. It, it's really a battle that you, you can't get rid of. I know there's a landowner in the Cedar Rapids area that at one time, I don't know if she still does, but she had you know full-time people working to control this plant. And I, I just don't know how you can do this in a cost-effective way at the moment. Another one that we're gonna throw on the list real quick, I kind of debated about it, but I got a phone call of a nursery still selling this this spring. That's bush honeysuckle. It's a native shrub to Siberia and East Asia. It's a definite ornamental plant, and it can be sold as amber or tatarian honeysuckle. Um, it grows 10 to 30 feet tall, completely shade tolerant, can own a forest easily, and one of the last to drop its leaves in the fall. But that's to our advantage. Um, that gives us a chance and a window to control this plant. There's a picture to the left of it. The flowers tend to be white, kind of pink in, in some areas. Um, they flower in April through June, and they have opposite leaves in two rows. The fruit um, tends to be that pinkish red, and it can be spread by the fruit and also by the root system. So here is a whole bunch of the honeysuckle growing along a roadway. To the right is a forestry mower. So in the woodlands, a lot of times we'll just mow it down, and they go through and spray, because you can see 
you don't get anything growing underneath there. That's a dense shade mat. So nothing native is going to regenerate. So if you mow it down, go spray the stumps and watch it. Um, there are other things that we've been trying. The picture to the left is a huge fail. I had to grab it from a stock photo place, the LME stock photo. Notice the lack of personal safety gear. I don't see goggles. I don't see gloves. <laughs> but they're spraying it out, out there. To the right is a little bit more secure. Um, they're spraying, once again, that glyphosate, in this case it's rodeo, over bittersweet. And if you look closely, it's got a bluish color because they're using a dye that will mark where they were so they don't overspray too much. And we're doing this late fall where everything's dormant, the leaves are off the trees to the right. So the picture to the right's more what we want to see. Some safety equipment, nobody walking through here, no reentry for 24 hours, you know, follow the label. But if you need help with this, I can help you get some information on managing it. I get a lot of phone calls on this lately and I'm still studying it. I, I don't have a strong opinion either way right now, but that's the aerial app application of Rodeo. So this is being done on sites that are completely lost to these invasive plants. And they go out with the air tractor in the fall and they overspray. So the first question I get is, well, in that picture underneath the plane is a conifer. Well, believe it or not, if you're in the Christmas tree world and you manage, you know, past with that, you know that you can overspray after about September 15th, 20th, depends on the temperature, and not kill the conifer. So then the question I have is what's going to happen long term to the hardwood or deciduous trees? Is it going to kill them or not? I've seen kind of minimal damage following this the last oh, probably four years to some trees. Cherries tend to be a little bit sensitive. Redbud are very sensitive. Um, but there's other things that we need to look at. I'll bring those up. And that's the cool season grasses that are still going to be present in the fall when everything else is dormant. They would need to be covered if somebody is going to go to this extreme measure. Um, it's a little bit more pricey. You have to have a contractor apply it. Then we have to look at other threatened and endangered species. What's there? You know, when we spray with, for gypsy moth and we put the scent to the female, we have to look for eagles' nests. We have to be aware. Um, let's go like with BTK and gypsy moths, we have to be aware of when the monarchs are emerging and not impact those. So there's a lot of things that we still need to look at on this one because we don't know those long-term effects. And then drift, well, using something called a micronair, which is in the picture to the right, it kind of goes against what you would think in the ag world. But when you're in the forestry world and you want to get your herbicide to the forest floor and not have the drift, this thing chops the droplets up to be micro, uh, micro nair, and blows them down quickly. And so there's almost no drift. So if somebody's going to do it, I would recommend using the micro nair. And there are pilots all over that do have this. But this is an extreme situation where you lost. We've seen prescribed fires be used, but they've had little to no success. Basal bark sprays do work, but because of how the honeysuckle grows and how wide it is, getting it underneath the main stem can be extremely difficult. Goats, I love goats grazing. They work very well on young plants. So if you don't see a lot of invasive plants, you could use goats and not just on honeysuckle, you can use it on other species, all invasive plants. And there are several goat groups that go around and they feed the young goats um, early on so they get the taste for, let's say, garlic mustard, honeysuckle, you name it, and they'll feed on it. So I think that is going to be something that's going to be upcoming more and more. I think we're going to see a lot more goat grazing. So when we look at everything, what have we learned? Um, I'm hoping that we're learning this. You know, we need to diversify our plantings. Um, and I, I don't know how to always do that. It can be difficult. If we look at our woodlands, you don't see more than 10% of a species or 20% of a genius. So if we did that in an urban area, I think that would be wise. You have to define that space. So if you're planning in a, oh, in a community, you could look at all the trees in the town of Cedar Rapids, or you can look at a homeowners association and say, okay, this homeowners association is a little high on maple. I've got a lot of Acer out here. It's over that 10%. We need to start looking at other species to diversify what we have. That way, if we do get a pest, it doesn't kill them all at once and it can be slowed down. 
So if there is management plans, it would give you time to use them. The other thing I think we're learning is we can no longer just passively manage our forest. At you know, one time you might, you'd buy your land, you'd enjoy it, you might have somebody come out and do a harvest on it once in your lifetime and kind of leave it alone. But now if you, you own that land and you're a steward of that land, you have to actively control these invasive plants as well as other insects to keep the populations low and replant as something goes out. And that's a great question. When ash goes out from our woodlands, what's going to come up in its place? What's going to regenerate? Is it going to be maple? Is it going to be something else? Or do we need to encourage other things to come in, which I think we do. Um, with all of these different insect pests and disease pests, we've had to look at more non-natives to get that to that diversity level. And I think that's okay. We just have to kind of study these non-natives. You know, we're learning from pear that there is a downfall for using Asiatic pear. Norway maple, there is a downfall. So which ones have less of a downfall, okay? And kind of move that around. Don't move firewood around. That's one of the ways that pests move. Um, and what else? You can drop your comments in the chat. And there's so many other things that we've learned for this. It's just, it's just intense. So I've got some online resources and I will see if Jeff can maybe I'll give him this presentation, post this, but the Iowa DNR has an invasive plant page. That's the iowadnr.gov forward slash invasives. In there is a pocket guide, and that's probably our most useful tool. If you wanna go out and identify an invasive plant, this little guide has got them by pictures. So you'll see the leaf and seed and stem, and then it'll give you the top two control methods for that plant. The Midwet Invasive Plant Network has a lot of things there, and then uh, Department of Agriculture and DNR, we run a, a page called iowatreepest.com. And that page has anything you want to know from emerald ash borer to gypsy moth to just about any other insect, um, it's posted there. And that'll have live updated stuff. This is my contact information. If you want to drop me an email and ask me a question or give me a call sometime, I'm glad to assist. That's what I'm here for. I love helping landowners and communities come up with plans. So there's many things out there. You know, when I was thinking about this presentation, I was trying to figure out what past I should and shouldn't include. So if you have questions about one, maybe I didn't put in here, I will be glad to address it. With that, I will turn it back over to Jeff, see what questions we got. Well, thank you, T-Bone. That was absolutely fantastic. And uh, let's just dive into some of the questions that we've received Please. so far. And I'm going to actually go in reverse order. So uh, you mentioned glyphosate as a control method, but would more targeted broadleaf herbicides be suitable alternatives? Okay, so I like that question, and I, I don't know that I have a great answer for it. There are some broadleaf herbicides that work quite well. But the problem is they sometimes work too well, and I'll pick on trifle care. It's a great one. You can broadcast spray it as well. Um, Garlin is an example of trifle care, but the problem is it can get through that bark and cause unintended damages, even though you don't use diesel or other surfactant. So there is a lot of research to be done on this that is going on through the Midwest Invasive Plant Network and the Forest Service, and I'm part of those teams. So each chemical we look at, but then we also have to look at, does it drift? What are the off-site benefits? So great question. If you have a specific one you want me to look at, feel free to email it. Great. So here's a question from Connie. She says, now, for individual bush honeysuckle control, is it going to be better to foliage spray with Roundup or to cut the plant down and then treat the stump? If it were me, I would wait till the springtime, cut the plant down and treat the stump. I would leave about two to three inches of the stump sticking up, cut it, and while it's fresh, paint that stump with concentrated, it would not dilute it, concentrated Roundup, and follow the label that this, this plant is on there. And then watch, you'll see maybe a few sprouts, spray those with diluted Roundup, that 3% as they show. And that should take care of it. That'll be easier for an individual plant. Excellent, excellent suggestion. And let me post that. Um, Ann wants to know, I live on five acres in Dallas County, mostly wooded. We're beginning to lose ash. Who could they hire to help manage and diversify their woods? Any suggestions, if not by name in general? Yes, so what I would do is get on the internet and search um, 
I, I issue Iowa State University consulting foresters list. And they have a list of consulting foresters that can come out. They walk the timber with you. They come up with different management options. It, ash is finally dying out enough that there's a little bit of a market value if you get them before they're dead. So they might be able to do some timber sales and get those out. Maybe it's just going to be firewood. Maybe it can be used for something else. Um, so there's quite a bit they can do there. I would get a consulting forester out there to walk that ground and give you a plan. Excellent suggestion. Um, Justin wants to know what about cutting and using Tordon to uh, treat the stumps? So Tordon, as we've learned over the years, has a flashback. And if you don't know what I mean when I say that, when you treat the stump with that, that chemical goes in there, but it doesn't stay in that root system. It goes outside of the root system and kind of hangs out in that soil. So let's say you've killed your invasive plant and you've got some trees planted. Well, Tordon can activate again, flashback and kill your future plantings. So that is the drawback with it. But if you're managing a large area where you've got lots of invasive plants, in this case, you know, Asiatic honeysuckle, you could do that if, just realizing that there could be flashback. It is labeled for it. But I, I try to find the ones that are the safest ones with the least consequences. And just a personal story, I grow hazelnuts in northern Iowa, and uh, when I first started, I would do exactly that, treat stumps of uh, ash trees or mulberries with the tordon, and uh, no more, because yep. exactly yep. what T-Bone ex um, ex uh, explained happened to me where some bushes had died because, uh, and of course, we were just painting it on, you being very um, careful, but still, it can happen, so uh, yeah, learned firsthand. Anyways, Michael wants to know any suggestions on controlling poison hemlock. Poison hemlock is a challenging plant, as he probably knows then. Um, the number one thing I would say there is stay on top of mowing. You have to mow that area if you can. If you can't, then you're down to foliar sprays, because obviously you can't hunt pull it, you're gonna get it. So foliar sprays, rodeo works well, garland works well. Um, there are several out there that are labeled crossbow. I don't know if you need some of those heavier hitters, but that's what I would look at is I would mow it first and try to control it that way and repeated mowing tends to thin it out and sometimes completely control it. But right now we're seeing it elevated because we are so dry in parts of the state and those dry areas, this is kind of a, an aggressive plant that wants to populate that area and it's going to hold it. So just stay on top of the mowing. I would try that first. Great suggestion. Um, I'm going to scroll up here now a little bit. Uh, someone wanted to know, now apologies here, T-Bone. This was when you were talking about uh, the disbar moth. Uh, Justin yep. wants to know, does it kill caterpillars other than disbar, whatever you were talking about? So there are two chemicals we talked about. So the mating disruption, which is the scent of the disbar moth, okay, formerly known as gypsy moth, is specific only to the male gypsy moth. They don't pick it up. That doesn't kill anything. It just disrupts their breeding. When you get to BTK, the bacteria that you spray out that's specific to caterpillars, it'll kill any caterpillar that's feeding on the forest at that time. And that's why we try to miss that monarch window. Dispar moth, formerly gypsy moth again, is earlier as a pest that emerges, it's not native, than um, monarchs and others that will be out there. So we have to go out, there's a point where literally we're out daily checking the forest to see if they hit a certain size and if they're feeding enough that when we spray it, they'll be dead. Great question. So yes, it can get a few other caterpillars, but it's not often. Great, great. Um, Michael brought up the nomenclature of the disbar moth, suggested continuing to use disbar moth so we can all get used to it. Uh, he says, FYI, the Romani are um, not the same as the Romanian people. Okay, great. Oh, great, thank great. you. Yeah. Um, um, just, just to that point, there will be a new name shortly. I don't know what it is, but we'll keep the Latin name in our presentations and, and public meetings until they get an official name. And it's probably going to be a few years before we can actually say that just that name and people know that it was formerly known as Gypsy Moth. It takes a little time to re-educate people, but we'll get there. Great comment. Yeah. Another question from Justin. Uh, any thoughts on county or state controlling more parsnip in the right-of-ways? Well, state, of course, on state lands, I'm hoping that we're doing our, our job of trying to mow it. I don't know of all the state lands out there. There's so much that we'd have to look at. Counties are doing the same thing. We have a lot of trainings in the spring 
sense. But I'm going to go back to our, our conditions right now being so favorable favorable for the plant. It is really difficult for anybody to stay on top of this. But if you know of an area that it's really bad, you can call the county or you can call whoever manages that state land and ask them if they can start mowing it. Uh, roadside managers in counties that have them would be a great contact uh, for individuals to reach out to. And uh, folks should really know about our roadside managers anyways, because they do a great yeah. job of not only managing the roadside, but to the best that they can, getting natives back into there. So uh, thank you for that, TiVo. Let's see what else we have here. Uh, have we hit all the questions? Folks, if you have additional questions, uh, please type them into the questions tab. And um, I think that's all we have so far. Well, well as I said I, earlier, feel free to email me or call me if you have any questions. And I appreciate everybody coming out today. Uh, T-Bone, really want to thank you for coming and joining us. Uh, this was a power packed uh, presentation and a lot of good stuff to share. So thanks a lot. You're welcome. My pleasure. Have a good day, everyone.